a Celtic quiz for you. Does this Irish name start with the sound p, the sound b, or the sound f? Oh, you knew it was a trick question, huh? Indeed, Irish words can do something quite unusual. They can mutate their starting sounds. I'm busy piecing together the epic history of Gelga. Tugging at threads, grasping for one that ties everything together, I'm noticing I barely have time for name drops. Proto-Celtic, boom, next. Ogham, boom, next. Mutation, boom. No, 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 wait, let's uh, explore that one. In its preliterate days, about the most traumatic thing to happen to the start of Irish words was that its peas fell off. And without this process today, we'd be speaking of Pyreland. So while Rome said piscis and pater, Irish has iesc and aher. Even Ireland's oldest writing system is missing a sign for that p. But otherwise, this oem script has neat syllables and beautiful inflected Celtic endings. Just a couple hundred years later, though, Goidilg emerged with a mystery. It was suddenly so different that it left linguists stumped how Irish could have changed this fast from Oem. Out of the blue, or the emerald green, come manuscripts filled with mutations. Mutations that Irish will never let go of. They come in two flavors. First, soft. That's a flavor? <laughs> Shevu, lenition, weakens letters into fricatives or even glides. Clan, machlan. Jas, yas, tu, who. Some lenitions have changed since Old Irish, like ha and ga were once the and the. We even lost my favorite lenition. Today's war was once war. The old clo settled on marking lenition with a dot. Nowadays you plop in an H. Mutation number two is uru, literally darkening or eclipse. Eclipse automatically turns any voiceless sound voiced. Pataka become b da ga. Pok, bok, kri, gri. Voiced consonants turn nasal. Boher, moher. Gelge, nelge. If you count like this book, you'll find a third mutation haspiration. This one's about vowels, specifically adding H to vowels after some words that end in a vowel. Kind of breaks up the two vowels. Old Irish, eith, but ni heith. And modern, eiren, but na heiren. What makes mutations especially devious is that they're triggered by grammar. If you asked an Old Irish scribe whose Czech this is, you better have known the difference between masculine, a thiech, feminine, a Czech, and plural, a Czech. And modern Irish? Oh yes, it keeps doing this. A chach, a chach, a gesajach. This happens galore. Muck means a son. Muck is a pig. You say an muck, but an wook. Why? Because feminine. Some words trigger an eclipse instead. Ebaras. Emliaclia. Evlorida. You will be is beitu, but if I ask, it's an meitu, and if you won't, ni veitu. With no word for yes or no, mutations are a must. Where do these transfigurations come from? Recall that those early elegant grammatical inflections had eroded. This often left Old Irish nothing more than a slender consonant to mark a meaningful difference. Mak, mak, dun. Dun. With its endings crumbling around it, Irish noticed something, and just in time, the very words that triggered these endings had also been messing with beginnings. Triggers ending in a vowel, like the feminine article, had been softening the next sound. Unmuck, unwook. Triggers ending in a nasal naturally turn the next sound nasal. Gelga, engelga. Now, with beginnings in place, triggers themselves were free to erode, or even vanish entirely. Irish had evolved a new way to do grammar. And when did this happen? Ask Welsh. Look, Cymraeg has mutations too! 
Well, then clearly these must be inherited, part of their shared common Celtic ancestry. I'm told not. Instead, their parents gave them the tools. Time provided the problem. Each language came up with its own solution. So when you shout to Padrig, remember to use the vocative. A Fadrig! When you speak from the heart, O Mokri. And when something's in Irish, it's Engelge. Stick around and subscribe for language.